Hello, and welcome to the Pain Points of Interest podcast. We want to tell the stories of people, their businesses, and the journey that they are on. Our purpose here is to gather a new perspective on starting, growing, and maintaining businesses of all sizes. So grab that cup of coffee, sit back, and join us as we start this conversation. Hey guys, this is your host, Sarah Harbuck, and Kristen Ellis is co-hosting with me today. Hello. Um, our guest is Jeremy Wells. Jeremy, good morning. Good morning. How are you? <laughs> good, good. Uh, it's Monday, so we're all having some trouble waking up. Are you uh, experiencing <laughs> <Yeah>. the same? <laughs> Get that I'm, I'm getting caffeinated as yeah. we speak. Good. I'm I'm, e- I'm East Coast, so we're a little bit we're a little bit ahead of everybody. You're, you're, you've got a little bit of a jump waking. on us yeah. right now. Um, That's right. That's <laughs> it's right. almost lunchtime for you. Um, yeah. So thanks so much for taking time out of your schedule to talk with us. We're very excited. Thank to you for having me. I appreciate to it. Hear yeah. your story. Now I was doing some creeping on your website last week, <laughs> and um, good, good. I I wanted to learn a little bit about you before I had you on, and I thought it was really cool that you have a PhD in political science, and you used to be wow. a teacher. So this is this is a bad time of year to bring that up. Oh, <laughs> oh well, okay. Well, a bad year to bring that up. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. a bad year. We won't get into that. A too, bad generation, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> we won't get into that. Hows and whys of political science. But I thought it was a really interesting jump that you said that you had been encouraging your students to follow their dreams and passions, and that you weren't doing that yourself. And I thought yeah. a political science professor um, jumping into money management, financial management that. I mean, usually when you hear that, I'm not following my passions. It's like, I, I want to go be an artist or a musician. Yeah. So hey, I thought that was interesting. Some people love numbers. I know. So tell us, <laughs> give us a little bit. You don't bit. go deeper into a technical field usually. You, <laughs> yeah, you, right? you kind of right. back out into something on the other side. So if, yeah, with that in um, mind, why don't you give us a little bit of your background and kind of why you shifted gears there a little bit? Sure. Uh, the the original intent when I when I first showed up for undergrad right after high, right after graduating high school uh, was going to be law school, oh. and uh, really really I wanted to do business law. I wanted to do more on the the written side of business law, like contracts and negotiating through writing that kind of stuff. Um, and and I was dead set for that. I, I had a political science major, which at the small liberal arts college I went to was the closest thing to a pre-law major uh, that they had. Yeah. And I added on a business minor. Okay. The, about the third or fourth semester in, I started taking some of those business courses. I signed up for accounting one and for business law. Uh, loved the accounting one class. Uh, hated the instructor of the business law course. And <laughs> so I ended up, you know, yeah. and, 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 and having been in that field, it you know I've been on both sides of how that one person at the front of the room can make or break a course. But yeah, uh, yeah. And so I uh, wound up just dropping uh, the business minor and really digging into political science. And you know, joking about uh, what's going on uh, inside our country right now, being election season and everything else in domestic politics. I actually focused on international politics. Oh. So. I was interested in how countries interact with each other. That is, um, that and, is really and cool. That yeah. was yeah. yeah, and so that was my focus. I was I was focusing more on on war and trade and uh, foreign aid and these kinds of international political issues. Mm-hmm. So I wound up going to grad school at Louisiana State University. Uh, okay. Spent six there, years there. Uh, spent a little bit too much time tailgating. Uh, a little bit <laughs> too much time uh, enjoying the food. But eventually, I mean, you know, it's college. Uh, yeah, I mean, you, you have to. <laughs> you gotta right? have a little and, fun, right? Um, Right, across right, it. right, exactly. It didn't help that a buddy of mine from college uh, wound up moving to New Orleans. Uh, he did Teach for America oh. down in New Orleans. I was studying LSU, so on uh, Friday evenings, uh, he would come up. Uh, to Baton Rouge, we would tailgate and go to the Tigers games on Saturdays, and then on Sundays I would go down to New Orleans to the Saints games with him. So nice. we had, nice. we had a, we had a lot of fun during that time. Yeah. Eventually, I I got my uh, PhD uh, dissertation written, got the got the degree, uh, landed a uh, full time but non tenure track teaching job at uh, Texas State University. Oh, okay. And so my wife and I moved there. I taught for five years there. I went to a small private K through 12 
institution. I graduated from a class of 21 or 22. Uh, <laughs> I went to a small liberal arts college on the other side of the state. I uh, graduated from a college class of about 400, 425. Wow, yeah. Then I went to LSU, um, you know, which so was a which jump. was a culture. Yeah. It was a culture. <laughs> As I say, bit of culture right? shock there, yeah. And, and I thought, Atlantic State University, LSU at the time I was there had around twenty five thousand students. When I got to Texas State University, they were pushing over thirty five thousand. They were wow. they were approaching forty thousand uh, when I actually left. It was a big institution. It didn't yeah. matter who you were you were you were just a cog in the, in the machine right. and that was that was a very different experience from what i'd had in undergrad and so it already wasn't a good fit uh for me personality wise career wise experience wise it wasn't what i was trying to do i was trying to emulate the professors that i'd had in my uh college experience and it wasn't working on that big you know public state institutional level yeah, because the class sizes and from one I, to the other are going to be so different, and I'm sure right. for you that wasn't <laughs> quite right. the jump exactly. you were hoping for. Exactly. I went. I went from just about every class that I took as an undergrad was a ten or twelve person seminar to every class wow. that I was teaching being a you know lecture fifty room. to two hundred and fifty person yeah. lecture. Yeah. Yeah. And it just none of the none of the teaching methods that that had been used on me when I was a student worked <laughs> at right, all right, uh, yeah. when I when I got there. So I, I already knew pretty quickly that it wasn't going to be uh, a good fit. And so over time, the question became more and more, if, if I wasn't here, what would I be doing instead? Gotcha. Uh, that question really came into focus when uh, my wife and I had our daughter uh, mm -hmm. in July of 2017. And so at that point, I, I knew uh, that career wasn't what I wanted to keep doing. Um, I had pretty much hit a glass ceiling as far as academia goes. If you don't get on the tenure track early, yeah. uh, you're probably never going to get on it. Yeah. And and being on the tenure track is what leads to promotion, pay raises, right. and, and actually making a career out of it. Yeah. So I started looking for something where I had a little bit more control over my future, um, over financial future, you know, work-life balance, work right. schedule, those kinds of things. Uh, and one day my wife and I had a conversation and naturally as somebody who thinks like somebody in higher ed, I started thinking about all the classes I had taken uh, back when I was in, in college. And I remember that semester that I took the, the, the two business courses and really liking accounting. Luckily, the university I was teaching at not only uh, had a really good accounting department, uh, but also had a program where uh, faculty and staff could essentially take courses for free. And so one nice. day I walked over to the business school. I talked to the grad graduate director of the accounting department. They had no problem with me coming and taking classes for, so for my last academic year at Texas State University, I was scheduling accounting courses in with my teaching schedule. So I would go teach a course, I would run over the business school, take an accounting <laughs> course, run back, teach another political science course, and and kind of jumping back and forth between wow. that. That was going to be my next question, because yeah. I was like, how uh, did you have to go back to school to get that degree? <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, political yeah. science and money management are not quite in the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I and I started doing that. And um, the interesting thing about accounting is the the education is important, but um, it, lawyers will talk about this a lot, right? There's very little similarity between law school and what you're actually doing as an attorney. <laughs> and and the same can be said of accounting. There there are universal aspects of accounting: credits and debits, financial statements, those kinds of things. But you can go through the entire education sequence and if you've never actually sat down with a client and tried to explain to them why their tax bill is fifty thousand dollars this year yeah. or you know you know why they need your help in cleaning up their bookkeeping that they haven't paid attention to for the last year yeah. um, or you know ju just talking to a prospect and explaining to them why they need to hire an accountant in the first place when they never have before yeah. right. you know those are the kinds of things they don't teach you in accounting school. So I got really lucky. And about the time I started thinking about signing up for some of these accounting courses, I was also reaching out uh, to as many accountants around me, both uh, in person and online as I could. And I got lucky one day. Um, I found one on Twitter uh, and uh, started talking to him. We went back and forth over direct messages and that turned into a 45 minute uh, phone conversation. And that turned into uh, him being a mentor. 
uh, oh, to nice. me. And he, you know, and so after Very about nice. three years, he, he's still my mentor. And, uh, you know, I still take the, the big questions as far as running my own business, helping others with their businesses, yeah. um, you know, fewer and fewer actual tax questions anymore. But, um, you know, there's still occasionally <laughs> those kinds of things because, you know, that that to me made all the difference. Right. Having yeah. somebody that uh, was willing to put himself out there for me, invest yeah. a little bit of time into me, um, but then also give me the independence to make the big decisions myself. You know, he would he would he would never answer a question directly. It would never be here's what you need to do. It was always you know, I've done it this way. You could also do it that way, but they're your clients. But, yeah. Um, and, and, and so at the same time, I felt like I was always being heard and getting the help I needed. He was also respecting me as a professional and, nice. and as yeah. an independent business owner. And so that, that really helped propel me, um, into, into the field, I think way more <laughs> than, uh, taking more classes would have. Um, well, I, you know, I hear a lot of people say, especially in fields like that, where you have this very direct focus, it, you know, you can you can do all the schooling you want, but it's the real world experience yeah. that teaches Hands you the most. It. Yeah. Um, and that's great that he, you know, I love the Internet for that very reason. You can connect with people and, and kind of get that more direct experience, uh, either through talking to them and asking questions or what have you. So I think that's. Got to love the new digital age yeah, <laughs> for that yeah, reason. Absolutely. Now, looking absolutely. at your website, you seem to have a specialty for dealing with and talking with realtors. What? That's a very narrow <laughs> target at group. So what made you kind of focus in on that particular group of people? Mm. Yeah. And, you know, this goes back to my mentor. My mentor, uh, his focus when, when he started his own firm was on you know, what he calls knowledge workers. And really even more specifically than that, uh, he was in Southern California and he w started his own firm when podcasting and actually, actually turning your podcast into a business was becoming a thing. Right, so right, a bunch right. of his first clients as an independent, uh, accountant was with podcasters and, and more broadly, uh, freelancers. And so, uh, some of the leads that he was sending me when I first started working with him were in that domain. But, uh, when I started actually, trying to get my own clients, I, I realized pretty quickly that I was leaning in a different direction. And uh, one of those directions was actually the, the realtor that had helped my wife and me buy our house when we were in Texas. And I helped uh, her uh, get her business organized, get the legal and the paperwork and the tax side of her business organized and up to date, those kinds of things. Nice. And the more I started working with her, the more I realized uh, how great of a job that field does at training its new real estate agents to sell and help their customers. But it does pretty much no job at helping them actually be business owners. Okay. And to oh. the point at which I I think most new real estate agents don't even understand that they actually are business, business owners, owners yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, a lot of them tend to wait for that 1099 in, in January or February, <laughs> and they think of it like a W-2, right? Yeah. You know, yeah. they think of it like, okay, this tells me how much I made last year. I'm going to plop that number into my tax return right. and that'll be it. Right. They don't understand that they're running a business, that they have obligations and responsibilities and also a lot of benefits that come from those responsibilities um, of, of being a business owner. And so a lot of what uh, I, I started doing was realizing that the connection between my previous career of, you know, being an educator, being somebody that was helping, uh, you know, students, uh, kind of open their eyes uh, to yeah. the world around them. When when I started working with realtors, uh, you know, particularly this first client and then some referrals that I got in that field, uh, helping them just open their eyes because a lot of them are coming from a W-2 experience. This client right. in particular, yes. she, you know, she'd managed a Starbucks location for a couple of years. And so she, and, and that was that was really the only job she'd had before she dove into real estate. And so her entire work experience was being an employee where your right. employer yeah. handles everything for yeah. you. They right. handle all the taxes for you, right? Yeah. Um, you know, the tax return just becomes sort of a, 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 a formality, right? A reconciliation. Right. Um, you know, and then here she is being a real estate agent for a couple of years and starting to become successful at it and, and 
quickly found herself uh, not understanding how this big number wound up at the bottom of her tax return yeah. and, yeah. you know, no. why she owed that much to the IRS. Right. And I, so, you know, yeah. As yeah. somebody who's uh, my, my husband recently started his own business. It was about a year ago. I, you know, one of the very first things we did, you know, was sat down and talked about money and money management. He was like, we're hiring an accountant. And I was like, okay, Good. let's do that. <laughs> you know, because there right. is, there's so much to learn. And I, I bet that's really beneficial to your clients you coming from, you know, education background, because you'll be able to teach, because there's so much to learn. And you it's need one, somebody it's one that, thing to just kind of throw information at a person. It's another thing to teach them right, how to use it. To make you understand why this is the way this is. Right. You know, because moving forward, <laughs> it makes things so much easier. Yeah. Yeah. When you actually know why. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, I, I think there's, I think the, the, the easy way, um, you know, and, and I, I do this myself because sometimes you get clients that just straight up say, I don't want to know about it. I don't want to hear about it. Yeah. I don't care about it. Just do it. I, you yeah. know, I'm busy. I'm yeah. busy doing my work. Just do it for me. Just take yeah. care of it for me. Yeah. And, you know, and I, and I do, but at the same time, um, you know, it, there's, there's a fine line between saying, okay, I'm, going to make sure your taxes in order. I'm going to make sure your books are in order. And then, no, you actually have to be a business owner. You have to understand right. your financials. You have right. to understand the decisions you're making in your business. You have to understand that you can't bring all of this information to me in March from decisions that you made the prior year and expect me to just work miracles with your tax return. You have to include <laughs> me in these conversations throughout the year. Yeah, uh, yeah. The, the, you know, so my business is Jaywell CFO. The, the CFO comes from, in part, from my mentor. Uh, he is CFO Andrew. That that's the that's the model that he built and taking that chief financial officer title from you know big corporations mm -hmm. and bringing that kind of service uh, and kind of thinking about right. helping people with their money decisions uh, down to the level of independent contractors freelancers entrepreneurs and yeah. even individuals and families um, and so you know I really try to put it out there to my clients that I am not just your tax guy. You know, you don't just drop off your shoebox of receipts in March <laughs> and then, you know, a week later, here's your tax return and your bill and we're done. Yeah. Right. I am there to be part of the process throughout the year, right? Yes, I am there yeah. to be part of the decision making. If you have a question about what's deductible, uh, right. how's this going to affect my taxes? Yeah. Should I, I'm, I'm thinking about buying a new car. Should I put it in the name of the business or personal? You know, all those kinds of decisions that, it's really easy to just make throughout the year and you know just take a guess at you don't have to do that right you have somebody essentially on staff right yes. <laughs> that if, uh, yeah. that that can help you uh, with those questions throughout it's, the year and nice so that, that yeah and that builds in that versus... educational component to it sure yeah. we had a we had a bookkeeper on um, a few weeks ago she has a, a small bookkeeping firm for herself here in the local area and she was you know kind of uh, telling us, you know, the, some of the common mistakes she sees a lot of people making when she comes in and starts, you know, taking over their bookkeeping mm -hmm. and what have you. What kind of things do you see a lot of business owners, uh, small business owners specifically, you know, kind of the biggest mistakes they make when it comes to their taxes or their, you know, money management situation that you kind of see as a common thread throughout that you could kind of give our listeners some tips on? Yeah. Hey, I'm interested in learning. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So um, the, the, there's really there's really two parts to this. The first part is, is more on a strategic level and the second part is more on a on a tactical uh, sure. level. So it's a okay. it's a two part answer The on the on the higher level. It's you have to think like a business owner. You have okay. to think like an investor in a business. You have to take yourself out of that day to day technical worker right. mentality not not 24 7 but sometime you know it, it's a couple times a week for for an hour at a time at most right? <laughs> you just have to pull yourself out of the business for a few minutes yeah and you have to yeah. think like somebody who owns this business somebody you know i i love shows like the prophet marcus limonis or uh you know restaurant impossible right these kinds right. of shows mm -hmm. where you have this this third party come in that has no emotional attachment to your business whatsoever yeah. and they just look at it as a business yeah. right they look at it as an investment opportunity because that's the kind of mentality you have to have with your own business so that that's you know thinking like a business owner that's that's on the on the higher strategic level so what does that actually mean tactically you know day-to-day -day operations the biggest threat uh, to small businesses from the perspective of an irs audit is commingling is not having a clear separation 
in terms of the financial assets, the, the yeah. cash of the business between what is personal and what is business. The first thing you have to do when you go into business for yourself, and that doesn't mean when you get your first 1099, it, it doesn't, <laughs> it means when you start making money as, you know, so, and, and paying bills, paying expenses as a business, you have to have a separate bank account for those activities. You yeah. have to have the income coming into that separate account and the expenses being paid out of that separate account. Because yeah. as soon as the IRS can't clearly tell the difference between what's business and what's personal, the automatic assumption is it's all personal. Yeah. Which, oh. guess what? You have all that income reported to you, That's but you no can't good. take any of those deductions. Yeah. Yep. Right? You're going to lose out on all those deductions if you're in an audit with the IRS. So commingling is the first way that you you physically separate the business from the personal. Right? right. Yep. Um, and then, you know, beyond that, you stop using the business or you don't start using, preferably, you don't start <laughs> using, or if you are, you stop using the business and its bank account as your own personal piggy bank. Right. You stop yeah. paying for personal expenses out of the business account. You don't buy groceries out of the business account. Right. You don't take a vacation out of the business account, those yeah. kinds of things. I worked for a couple again, of companies you, that did that and they didn't last long. <laughs> no. yeah. Right, yeah. right. You know, again, you have to think like a business owner and you have to think of yourself as that day-to-day -day operations person as one of your employees. And would you allow your employee to pull right. money out of the business's cash till and go take a vacation with it? Of course mm -hmm. not. So you can't allow yourself <laughs> to do that either. Yeah. 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 yeah, that's a common issue. Uh, and I was just curious to see what your opinion is actually being a, an expert in this field. But as something I've watched other businesses and even myself having to make that separation and that delineation between personal and business uh, you know what you just said is right on the money you know we sometimes when we have our own businesses I think invest so much emotional uh, currency in it and emotional energy and it's hard to separate yourself out mm -hmm. and look at it objectively and I noticed with a lot of people who couldn't do that it was, yeah. it was to their own detriment and yeah. then separating the finances yeah. it seems like a yeah. no-brainer right. you would think that that would be the automatic thing but a lot of people don't and it's just shocking to me and i'm thinking that's a real good way to get into a lot of trouble yeah. <laughs> it's just absolutely they don't absolutely. know and this comes know? back to yeah. you know this comes back to thinking like an educator right when i would come right. in the first day of a class I came in with the assumption that nobody in that room had, because I taught an introductory course, so I had to come in with the assumption that nobody in that room had ever heard anything about what I'm getting ready to spend the next 14 or 15 weeks teaching them about, right? Yeah. And just because I'm working with somebody that's been running a business for three, four, five years, and they know their business very well, it doesn't mean that I can assume that they know how to be a business owner. Right. Yeah. Right. So so I have to start from square one. I have to look at the financials. Hopefully there are some financials. You know, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> hopefully hopefully there's some sort of bookkeeping. And, you know, not everyone needs a, a bookkeeping you know, software suite at the ready. I, you know, it's, there there are small, simple enough businesses to where you need a spreadsheet. Right. Yeah. yeah. But you need something other than bank statements. Right. So yeah. when I have when I have a client come to me and, you know, it's tax time. And so here's 12 months of bank statements. I send it back to him and I say, I can't I can't do anything with that because yeah. I don't know. First of all, all of the lines on that bank statement are gibberish. It's that it's it's the <laughs> if you've ever actually looked at a bank statement, most of those descriptions of those transactions right. are gibberish. Yeah. And I don't know what you actually did when you paid for something at that place. You know, if I see McDonald's, I don't know if you were there with a customer or not. <laughs> yeah. If I see Starbucks, I don't know if you yeah. were there with a client or not. Right. Right. So right. you as the as the business owner have to help me understand what your actual day to day business operations are before I can start doing the higher order things of helping you with your taxes, helping you plan your business, those kinds of things. So it's more of a partnership. And again, this goes back to the CFO title, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the CFO kind of service is I, you know, I, I don't want you to see me as just your tax guy. Obviously taxes is a big part of it. It's the number one expense for small business owners. Yeah. But uh, you know, the same way the CEO and the CFO work as a partnership in a big corporation, I want you to feel that same way. So you don't, you know, you were just saying you, uh, you help with taxes and, you know, mm. kind of figuring out their bookkeeping. Um, what are some other things that you offer? Do you, you know, give advice on whether they should be a sole proprietor, an LLC, a yeah. C Corp, all those things? Yeah. What does the extent of your um, advice entail? 
Yeah. So uh, let me start here with with you know the the credentials. So I'm an enrolled agent. Okay. Uh, I, I'm not a CPA. I'm working toward that uh, toward that license. But um, one one thing that's important there that uh, everybody thinks they know what a CPA is, right? right. Because that's mm-hmm. that we just throw those three letters around in the in the accounting <laughs> world. You know, people don't say I need to hire an accountant. They say I need to hire a CPA, right? Yeah. Um, and, and whether they realize what that actually means or not. Uh, when you are looking for a tax professional, there's actually a few different credentials you can go with. And sorry, I'm... <laughs> <laughs> technical difficulties. Are we good here? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, my speakers went out there. No, for you're a fine. Okay. It's all right. Gotcha. Okay. So, uh, there are a few different credentials uh, in the tax professional world. CPA is one of them. Mm-hmm. Um, there's no guarantee that a CPA is actually a tax expert. In fact, the the CPA title is is not a designation of being a tax expert. It's actually a license to do what we call audit and assurance work. It's okay. a tool that lets you. It's a license that allows you to sign off on businesses and nonprofits, uh, tax exempt organizations, financial statements as verifying that they are accurate and they're reconciled based on proving that what happened, what you're saying is happening in those financial statements actually happened. Okay. So, so when we, when, when we talk about assurance or attestation or audit financial audits, that's the domain of the CPA license. So okay. if you, have a CPA license, you can't do that kind of work. Now, that means a lot of CPAs actually aren't tax professionals. They're Mm -hmm. audit professionals. They're financial statement professionals. So now tax is part of the requirement to become a CPA. In fact, there are four parts of the exam to become a CPA, and one of them is tax. But that means there are three others, right? There are three other parts of accounting that CPAs are actually tested on, whereas an enrolled agent this is a credential that comes from the Department of Treasury, the U.S. Department of Treasury. It's a it's a credential directly from the IRS oh. that gives the holder the right and privilege of being able to represent taxpayers to the IRS. Oh. Now, CPA, okay. based on having that license, can do that also, as well as attorneys who specialize in tax. But the EA is the only credential that is specifically for federal tax professionals. So with that credential, it means that the IRS will pay attention to me if I am representing you because you got a notice from the IRS or because you're uh, in trouble owing back taxes, these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. That's essentially what that what that title enrolled agent means. So the most basic services that I provide my clients are tax preparation, but then also what I call tax tax representation. Right. So okay. if you have issues with the IRS, if you get notices from the IRS, um, if you owe back taxes to the IRS and you're looking for help on negotiating with the IRS, these are the kinds of things that I can help you with. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. There's also part of that is tax planning, um, figuring out how to structure your business um, mm-hmm. the best way to get the best tax deals uh, yeah. that you can moving forward. So back to your lead into the question, should you stay a sole proprietorship? Should you think about an S corporation? And do you need an LLC for that? Uh, and what about a C corporation, right? right now right, we have yeah. these, you know, ever since uh, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017, now we have this flat 21% tax rate for C corporations. So it used to be that for smaller businesses, the S corporation made more sense tax wise. Now it's more of a question. Uh, yeah. there, there's not a guarantee that the S corporation is the best way to go. But there are other differences between S corporations and C corporations that matter. And then, of course, if you have multiple owners, uh, that defaults to a partnership. So you might want to stay a partnership instead of becoming an S corporation. There are all these different calculations and it depends on not just trying to save taxes, um, although that's a big part of it, but there are other factors that come in as well. So what's the ownership structure? How are the owners going to get compensated for the profitability 
of the business. How stable is the business going to be? Do we expect this thing to still be in existence 5, 10, 20 years from now? Or are you just doing this because, you know, it, it seems like a good gig. And so you might play around with it for a year or two, but then you don't really know. Yeah. You know, I have yeah. clients who, uh, because of, because of the businesses they were working for and their tax calculations, they, uh, changed some of their employees from being actual employees to started paying them as independent contractors. Okay. <laughs> that means they automatically, right. Turned all of their employees into small businesses, yes. um, whether they oh. realized it or not. And usually they didn't tell them that. Right. <laughs> yep. Um, and yeah. so, and so a year or two later when they file their first couple tax returns as an independent contractor and not anymore as an employee, and they yeah. realize the difference, right. Tax implications of that. Then they go searching for an accountant. So there's explaining what that means. But at the same time, they realize the added complexity of being an independent contractor, of being a small business as opposed to being an employee. And some of them don't want that. Some yeah. of them want to go back to being employees. Right. So we start having the conversation about how to bring their taxes down. And an S corporation, a lot of times in that conversation makes sense. But they tell me they're still looking for a normal W-2 job. <laughs> So do I want to go through the process of registering an LLC, electing S corporation status, setting up books, filing tax returns as an S corporation, when I know that six months from now, they might take a full-time employee gig with a different company and shut the whole thing down. Yeah. Right. right? Yeah. So there's a lot of different factors that, that go into this that are beyond just, you know, being taught what an S corporation is and how it works. Right. Well, I mean, there's so many moving parts and so many different pieces of the puzzle. So every, not everybody's yeah. going to fit the mold every right, time. Right. And I imagine it's a case by case basis sitting down with each client going, okay, tell me a little bit about what your company is and where you plan to go with it. And then starting there and going you know, down that, that rabbit hole in, in terms of what advice you give them. Cause I can imagine, you know, you've seen a lot of different things with a lot of different types of companies and, you know, uh, trying to fit that all into a, a very easy formula is very difficult. Yeah. So, I mean, I know for us over the last two decades running different businesses, you know, we've gotten a lot better at it and more efficient <laughs> and we take, we go to the professionals immediately now yes. rather yes. than yeah. waiting a year or two in going, oops, we might've messed up here. Right. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, that's, that's, I got, I'm sure for you as the, you know, type of business you have, it's one of the big struggles I imagine or obstacles to overcome with people is understanding the importance of someone like you and how yeah. much value you bring to a company in you terms of getting their a lot of people would save themselves a lot of stress and a lot of headache if they would <laughs> and money you. really yeah, yeah. in the long run yeah, yeah. Yeah. if you just go ahead and make that expense for your business right away to hire a professional yeah to help you so that yeah. you don't get in trouble later because that's why you went to school is to learn all these right. things right? right so that we wouldn't have you to went to school it. for six right. years what do you expect us to figure it out in ten minutes <laughs> yeah I mean you know <laughs> yeah that's well the, and you also didn't start your business to be a bookkeeper sure you didn't start your business nobody to be a you started does. your business to do whatever it is that your business does, right. which is not all of those things, right? Because you're right. not an accountant. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, you know, there is a, I, in every, in every business, uh, there is a point from the beginning to some point down the line where you are the CEO, the chief everything officer, right? Mm -hmm. And you've yeah. got to do it all. Um, right. And the difference between uh, a, an owner who, scales the business and builds the business in a way that is sustainable and works for the the owner rather than the other way around is the one who gets that finding professionals that they know like and trust mm -hmm. and beginning to delegate that kind of uh, getting advice and making decisions to those professionals uh, that that makes all the difference in the world. Yeah. Um, when you're not and, burdened and, by those yeah. daily financial bookkeeping things or or even the the quarterly statements or whatever and you let that be taken care of by someone who actually knows all the ins and outs of that, I feel like you can scale your business quicker and faster by letting someone else handle that so you can actually you get to the business to, of right. your business. Right. Does that make sense? <laughs> this is this is uh Michael Gerber's the e-myth. Uh, right, that you should be spending less time working in your business and more time working on, on your business. Your business. Uh -huh. Right, yeah. there yeah. is a there is a trade-off. Every minute that you're spending 
trying to figure out the books for the business from the last month mm -hmm. uh, or trying to figure out how the new tax law is going to affect you and your business, uh, that's a minute that you're not making more sales. Right. right. That's a that's a minute that you're not staying in touch with your existing customer base and finding out ways to provide more value to them so that you can upsell them. Well, you know, you, yeah. A lot of people that, you know, I've talked to you said, I just don't, I don't know if I can afford the expense of that when mm -hmm. I'm starting out. Mm -hmm. What do you say to people who, who have that sort of mentality? And, and, you know, I can see both sides of it. I've been on both sides of it, you know, right. where I'm like, I don't know if I can afford that. But knowing that if I just spent that money, I would probably be better off in the long run. So what do you <laughs> tell people when you right. come up against that particular concern. Yeah, for sure. Uh, well, the, the accountant's answer, um, which, which <laughs> doesn't really work with business owners, but the accountant's answer is that it, it, it stop seeing it as an expense and see it as an investment. Yeah. Uh, you know, and that, and that's really the, the best way to think about it. But, uh, like I say, for most business owners that, that usually doesn't work. So <laughs> the, the actual answer that I provide to my prospects is there is a range of services and there is a range uh, of you know what you're actually needing today mm -hmm. and so I have I have some uh, clients that came to me recently that they're just looking for a little bit of guidance a little bit of clarity uh, a little bit of help thinking about how to make some of these decisions as right. they're growing their business and so they have a relatively limited uh, engagement or agreement with me as far as the services I'll provide and they have a price that reflects that yeah uh, I have other clients that they've proven the model of their business they have uh, relatively high profits they have relatively good cash flow and they know that they should be out in the field doing the work of their business not in the office trying to figure out how to how payroll works yeah. and so they they outsource uh that work to me um yeah. or to you know whatever account they end up hiring but right. uh you know that that is that's what matters is th there's a there's a level first of all there is there's a lot more to accountants um good accountants than just tax preparation sure right? sure um you know and that and, and that's got to get done every year of course right yeah but there's a lot more to it than that and there's automatically this sort of response of, well, you know, if it costs this much to do a tax return, then how much more will it be to do all? Right. Um, but how much is it costing you to, one, not know what you're doing, right? right. And all the uncertainty, all of the stress that goes along with time. that. And, and the time, time right? And yeah. then yeah. there's also the additional cost of trying to f figure all of that out yeah. because you know, I can do a month's worth of your bookkeeping in 10, 15 minutes, yeah. whereas you're sitting there for an hour or more or trying three. to figure out yeah. <laughs> how the bookkeeping software works in the first place, right? right? Exactly. When, you know, that's an hour or two that you just lost in increasing the revenue of your business. Yeah. Yeah. I look at it like preventative maintenance on your car. You go in for regular mm -hmm. tune-ups yeah. and oil changes right. and things like that. And yes, you're going to spend some money doing that. But usually, if you're doing preventative maintenance, you will not have and be stuck with a gigantic bill when something catastrophic happens. Yeah. Yeah. So if yeah. people would really just look at it that way, like this is, like you said, an investment, but also you're doing preventative maintenance yeah. on your business in order to make sure something really terrible doesn't happen later on down the road and that you can continue to stay in business right? Uh, because right. of that. So yeah. Yeah. for well, as you as a business owner, um, what are some tools that you use that help you, um, you know, keeping your books or, you know, any little tips and tricks about that particular aspect? Yeah. Um, so, you know, as far as my actual work, uh, you know, it, I, I'm a big fan of QuickBooks Online um, and I have lots of clients that I either uh, take that over uh, for them because they already had it set up or I'll set it up for them uh, and, and get their bookkeeping done. And, you know, this is a this is another part of the education that, you know, bookkeeping is a lot more than just checking up on your bank feed, right? And right. and knowing, you know, categorizing transactions, putting transactions in these different buckets, and then, okay, that's fine. It's tax time. Here's my here's my P and L. You know, go do what you do. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot more to it than that, 
right? right? And, and, you know, just because you think you have a simple business doesn't necessarily mean that you can't get some value out of having good up-to-date financials for your business, sure. right? So if you're running a business with no financials, the only financial data you have is the bank balance, is the is the cash in the bank. And that doesn't tell you anything. Right. It doesn't tell you if your business is actually profitable or not. Right. It doesn't tell you if the advertising spend for your business has a positive ROI or not. Right. It doesn't tell you if you have spreading that advertising spend out across three or four different places whether you should be putting more money into one of those and pulling money out of the others, right? Yeah. You can do that. You can have that kind of analysis. You can do those kinds of breakdowns when you have good, up-to-date, accurate financials. Um, and so, you know, that's that's a big part of the, the value add when it comes to not only bookkeeping, but letting somebody else do that to make sure things are getting accurately categorized and that they're getting categorized on time so that you're not sitting down on a Saturday morning when you'd much rather be doing almost anything else <laughs> yes, and right? trying to figure out the last three months of bookkeeping because you fell behind on it. Yeah, right? yeah. Um, you know, and so so that's definitely a big part of it. Uh, you know, I have I have some uh, tax software that I use. It's also in the uh, so Intuit is the big company that owns mm -hmm. QuickBooks Online. Yeah. It's also the big company that owns TurboTax, which a lot of people uh, know and use. Um, but they also have professional level software, so I use their tax software as well. And it just provides this ecosystem where everything. Uh, you know, integrates uh, with everything else uh, well. Now, that that's the boring, you know, my <laughs> side of things. As far as uh, actually working with clients, um, so the probably the most important pieces of software that I use are it, it starts with scheduling. It starts with mm -hmm. getting people through the pipeline. And so yeah. I use I used to use Calendly. I've switched to Acuity yeah. uh, scheduling. I use Squarespace for my website, and Acuity is now part of the Squarespace family. And yeah. so it just integrates really easily easy, yeah. uh, with the website. But you know whether I was using Calendly or or now Acuity, whichever one of the and there are a couple others out there, but those are the two main ones I believe. But whichever one you use. Uh, stop going back and forth over email. Stop going back and forth over the phone trying to figure out a time to <laughs> meet. Uh, just, just let somebody pick a time that works for them on your calendar. Just make it, you know, make it simple. Yeah. Um, as far as actual uh, meetings, uh, I again, I, I used to use Zoom. I now use Google Meet. Uh, I have a lot of the uh, planning and the the file storage for the business in G Suite, and so Google Meet uh, integrates well with that. Also integrates well with Acuity. I have it set up to where um, it'll record all of my. Uh, calls, video calls with, with nice. prospects and clients so that I always have that record yeah. Uh, yeah. was discussed yeah. um, in those meetings, uh, yeah. you know, and that's, that's, that's big, right? Yeah, you know, that, that's big when, days, when a client yeah. comes back to you and says, but no, you told me to do this in the meeting and I can go back and I can say, no, I, didn't. I, I told you that was an option. I didn't tell you to do it. Right? Yeah, you, know, yeah. you know, and there's a big difference, right? Thank you know, goodness difference for technology. Between, right? I, I don't own right? your business. I don't run your business. Yeah. You run your business, yeah. right? Um, and then, you know, along those lines, um, but but as far as uh, asynchronous video communication goes is Loom. And I absolutely love Loom. So that's Loom with an L, L-O-O-M. Okay. And this is, this is essentially uh, capturing your screen and also having down in the corner uh, your webcam view okay. along with the audio. So uh, one, one of the, one of my typical use cases for this is when I'll pull up uh, a client's, you know, monthly or quarterly financial statements, or I pull up their uh, tax return that I've just finished preparing. I will go through that with them. I'll, you know, point out things. I will explain things and they're seeing what I'm seeing on the screen as I'm going through it. Nice. And that produces a two or three minute video that I send them a link to. That's cool. And yeah. now they can watch that video whenever they want. Uh, they can respond to me with questions, but it doesn't need to be a 30 minute meeting in the office. It's a two minute video that you can watch, you know, while you're 
waiting on the kids to get done with soccer practice or nice. whatever. Yeah. You know? So it's um, a really efficient use of time for everybody. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Which is a, exactly. Which is a very important. Yeah. Especially when you Absolutely. have small children. Yes. Um, definitely. Yeah. Right. So right. exactly. You, you, you know, you, I, I've got a three year old, and you know, it, it's you. You said earlier about you know you 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 that emotional attachment you have to your business. So so I started this business not long after our daughter was born, yeah. and you know my my wife she she stays home uh, with our daughter and so during the day she's raising her i'm building this business and you know we both kind of have our babies going on yeah, um, yeah, you know at the yeah. at the same time but yeah but you know so i try to really you know th there's a there's a parallel between trying to make things easier on yourself and making things easier on your customers and clients right yeah, the easier right. i make it on myself to get people onto my calendar the, the easier i'm making it for them to get onto my calendar right, right? Yeah. the easier i make it on myself to communicate to them about their businesses, about their tax returns, the easier I'm making it on them to get that information and, and know what to do with that information. Right, right. Yeah. Now, you you have a presence on Instagram, and, uh, you know, I'm sure for a money management, financial management, tax preparation type a business, you know, having a, a social media account can be a challenge on how do you get people to be interested in what you're doing because let's yeah. face it sometimes this kind of stuff can be like the the non-glamorous part of running a business it's the 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 tool and the meat and potatoes that you just have to do um <sighs> but you do these little little video clips and snippets of advice that you give and what made you kind of go in that direction with your social media presence versus say a static image or text um, yeah do you notice that you get a lot more attention through a video well, I, you know, I just think statistically, right, uh, mm -hmm. video works better and especially uh, video with captions um, because yeah. people, uh, people, when they're scrolling through the feeds, they want video, but they also have their phones on silent. Right. Um, you know, because they're they're usually at work or they're usually in <laughs> right. public, and so they they want they want movement, they want visual, uh, but they also don't want the audio. And so you know, you have to have you have to have both of those uh, things. You have to have the video, but you also have the the captions of what's actually being said. And so, uh, so I started off um, when I when I got serious about uh, marketing for my business, uh, doing a. A podcast, an interview style podcast, um, similar to this, and I did that for for about six, six, seven, eight months, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was putting out a putting out an interview a week, and I, I really enjoyed uh, the engagements, the conversations, but I realized that. Uh, you know, it wasn't it wasn't giving me the opportunity uh, to really do what what I'm built to do, which is, right. which is educate, you know, which is educate and inform and, and, and explain things. And so I started, uh, looking for a different way. Um, there is a, uh, an independent, uh, marketing personality. Um, you know, he, he runs his own media business, uh, named Sean McCabe. He goes by Sean West on social media. And I've been following him for years, ever since I was back in, in higher education, because, uh, he focuses a lot on, writing, how to write more clearly, uh, how to present yourself more clearly through through writing, through speaking, all these kinds of things. And about the same time that I started looking for an alternative uh, to that approach, uh, he was putting out a new product that he calls the Daily Content Machine. And this is, it, it, they, they basically do all the hard work, right? Because mm -hmm. for a long time, my wife and I were saying, okay, the podcast is fine, but I need something that's just me. Yeah. Um, just me talking to the audience directly. And so I, we tried a few different things. Um, you know, I've, I've got an iPhone that comes with the built-in clips app, um, you know, and you can, you can record a quick 30 second clip of yourself and it'll add the transcriptions, but there's, there's no grammar, there's no punctuation. And, <laughs> you know, I, I'm a professor. I, I right? need the grammar and the punctuation <laughs> to be right, you know? And so I was, I was, you know, recording a 30, 45 second clip of myself talking and then spending 20 minutes trying to clean it up. And, you know, that just wasn't sustainable. So, uh, what, um, what Sean's uh, product does, Daily Content Machine does, is it takes an hour of just raw footage. Uh, and so just like this right here, I sit down in front of my webcam, I have some notes, um, and, and depending on the topic, those notes are more or less involved, and I just spend about an hour uh, just telling the camera things that I would uh, think uh, would be helpful for my clients, yeah. for prospects, for business owners. I upload that video uh, to them, and a week later, I get these seven beautiful, transcribed, formatted, 
clips uh, that are uh, and I get different versions. I get a version for Twitter. I get a version for Facebook. I get a version for Instagram because all yeah. of those different platforms have uh, different requirements as far as the size of the video. So if you try to take uh, just raw uh, video that is you know landscape uh, and you try to upload it to Instagram, it's not going to work, right? Yeah. Because yeah. Instagram TV is set up for our tall cell phone screens, and it's set up for the square uh, of the of the main feed, right? So you've right. got to have something different for those. So, you know, it's been a really valuable service to me. I've been doing that for a few months now. This is this is what you're seeing, and you know, it's an invest again. It's an investment, right? I don't see. Uh, you know that as an expense, right? Marketing, advertising—it shows up as an expense on my on my income statement. I don't see it uh, as that because <laughs> uh, one, it, it's it's attracting you know uh, right. an audience on those social media. But even really, even more important to me than that uh, is it's it's allowing me to develop my own confidence in my expertise, right? Because yeah, it really yeah. challenges me to sit down and pick a topic and spend an hour trying to figure out how to right. explain that. Uh, to in a way that not only does a good job of explaining it, but makes somebody want that explanation uh, yeah. in a in a in a field where, like I said earlier, most people would just rather not, right? Yeah. They yeah. they they just they just want to hand off their stuff to their accountant and be done with it, and just you know, here's my stuff. Tell me the bad news. Tell me how much to write a check for, and we're done. <laughs> um, you know, and and though that that's that's my person, right? That's my ideal client. That's the yeah. person I'm trying to get through to. Um, and, and so, you know, being aware of that, uh, starting off, but, yeah. uh, you know, and then at the same time, I I've got uh, all of that stuff goes, I, I keep the files on my computer, but all of that stuff is posted publicly to, uh, the different social media outlets, including YouTube. So yeah, nice. when I get done posting uh, a video, if I ever get asked a question by a prospect or a client, uh, about, uh, you know, video. that relates back to that. Yeah. Instead of spending half an hour trying to figure out how to write this email, you know, back to <laughs> them with them the link. answer they're looking yeah. for <laughs> when it's a prospect. And I don't even know if I'm ever going to make money off these people. Right. <laughs> right. Right. Um, you know, it's, it, it takes me 30 seconds yeah. to copy that link. It's a really yeah. smart, say, right. it's a smart way to yeah. do that. Yeah. Thanks Instead for the question. I have a video time. on the topic. Watch, you know, watch the video. Yeah. Let me know if you have any follow-up questions. Yeah, and yeah. so now, not only have I answered their question, but I've also established an expertise because guess what? I have a YouTube channel where I answer questions like this. <laughs> right. It That's makes you seem right. so like yeah, you know yeah. knowledgeable. <laughs> and you do. You, you, do you seem very, very focused on your clients and helping people and educating people and passionate about what you do. Is there is, you know, a lot of people some starting a business would be hesitant to hire an accountant because they don't know that they can trust someone with their money. You know, everybody's heard the horror yep. stories, Yep. you know? Uh, so what, what advice would you have, uh, you know, I mean, to find somebody like you, somebody find a good accountant, like you mentioned earlier, you know, <laughs> somebody that would, right. that you, is actually trustworthy with their money. Cause I know that that can be an issue with people, you know, <laughs> and, and I, I've got videos on this topic. Um, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> But yeah, the, the, the quick answer is, you know, I, you, you, ha, you have to go through those t three stages, right? You have to go through the know, like, and trust. So yeah. the first thing is you have to give people an opportunity to know you. You have to put content out there, right? Yeah. You know, whether it's, whether you're hearing it from Gary Vaynerchuk or you're hearing it from <laughs> Tom Ferry, if you're a realtor or, you know, hearing it from me, you have to put content out there and you have to, you have to put it out there regularly and you have to put content out there that isn't trying to sell people, but is actually trying to educate and inform people. Yeah. Right. You yeah. have to, right. you have to be answering their questions for free. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. you know, and that, that's hard. That's hard for a lot of yeah, business of owners and especially yeah. professionals in these technical fields, um, you know, to, to wrap their heads around, but you have to do it, uh, because those questions are, are out there. Um, and then you have to get into the like part, um, you know, and, and, and this is where it can kind of start to fall apart, right? Because <laughs> you have to be, it gets back to the kind of content you're putting out there, right? You have to put out content that is going to make them be interested in the topic and you. Um, so you, you know, I, I can't do the professorial sage on a stage thing, you know, where I'm just <laughs> up there telling you, here's what you need to know for the exam. I have to put this in a way that, you know, actually makes you want to be interested in it. And then you start gaining that trust. Right. Um, and so, uh, you know, it, it's really, it, it's really 
about that. The other thing is um, there's a flip side to it, right? So not just the content you're putting out there, but also once they start paying attention to you, what do they see? Uh, and, and so what are they reading in the bios of your social media accounts? Are they seeing yeah. anything there that correlates to the content that they're seeing and then also to what they need? Right. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I put a video out um, a couple of weeks ago and, and in that video, I say, you know, things like do they, you know, if you if you get to the point to where you're thinking about hiring them and you do a consultation or you do an interview, you know, ask them questions that you wouldn't normally ask an accountant. Don't ask them how much can you save me on taxes? Ask them what yeah. podcast do you listen to? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because if you as come to this accountant as a realtor and that accountant has no idea how the real estate industry functions, what's important to realtors, what's going on in real estate, yeah. right? That person, they, you know, they could do a great job doing your taxes. They're not really going to be able to be, be much help in terms of advising you on your business, right? right so right. if you look at my podcast app on my phone, I listen to real estate podcasts. I listen to Bigger Pockets. I listen to Real Wealth Network. I listen to the real estate CPAs. I listen to other accountants that are talking about how they help realtors because that gives me ideas to help my own clients right um you know so ask them what social media accounts do they follow you know where are they getting their ideas you know ask them things that aren't just don't interview them as if you're hiring an accountant interview them as if you're hiring a business partner right yeah. how are you yeah. going to help my business because how are you going to help me what run an my accountant business? is, is uh, yeah is they are a partner in your business because yeah. they're helping you, you know. achieve success success yeah. on a financial level right. exactly sure. yeah yeah, right. yeah that's a very good way to right. put that yeah awesome well jeremy we're gonna have to wrap it up but why don't you tell everybody where they can find you online social media all that jazz absolutely so my business is jwell cfo and that is where you can find me. So it's jwellscfo.com uh, and then at jwellscfo on all of the, the major social platforms, uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, Instagram, uh, Facebook, and uh, and YouTube as well. YouTube. And, awesome. and you know, go there. And yeah, I'm posting that content daily. Uh, nice. And if you go there and you find a few videos that help you, great. Uh, if you're looking for something and you don't find it, let me know um, because I'm always looking for more ideas for uh, those, those videos. Awesome. Thank you so much for being with us. Your yeah. enthusiasm for your job is, is infectious. It is. <laughs> and I've really enjoyed listening to you today. Uh, something, you know, these topics can be kind of uh, sedate sometimes, but I've really just been like, wow, he's it's like been, just yeah. so, yeah. so excited about his job. It's really, it's w rare sometimes to find someone, especially in your field, to be this like, woohoo, let's do this. Let's teach people. It's great. <laughs> it I is. love it. it is. Thank you so much for coming on and telling us your story. And we hope everybody enjoyed listening today. If you are interested in being a guests on our podcast please visit our website at painpoints.com or any of our social media and contact us we'd love to tell your story uh, if you're listening on apple podcasts please leave us a re review it helps us out quite a bit yeah, and if you're listening know. on youtube like comment and share and on spotify give us a little bit of a follow so you don't ever miss an episode jeremy thanks so much we hope you have a great week and we'll have to have you back for yeah. more financial questions yeah. in the it future it's great talking to you yeah definitely absolutely so. you too i look forward to that awesome <laughs> all right well jeremy thanks so much and to all of our listeners out there thanks for tuning in and we'll catch you next time have a good one